Jenny, a very, very warm welcome to you. Um, I was, we're all looking forward to this lecture and uh, we're grateful that you could manage to give it to us at a comfortable time for you. Uh, you're in England, not on the West Coast of America because then you would have been up even before the sun came up. So thank you very, very much for being with us today. On behalf of the trustees, I thank you the chairperson, the director general of the CSMBS, Mr. Sabya Sachi Mukherjee, on my own behalf, behalf of the executive committee of the Museum Society of Mumbai and our members and all our guests who are joining us here this evening. So thank you so much, Jenny. We're really looking forward to having you with us this evening. And you have a number of friends who've joined us as well. And I hope that they will ask you questions at the end of the evening. Just a few words about our good friend, Dr. Jenny Rose. She holds a doctorate in ancient Iranian studies from Columbia University, New York, and a master's degree from SOAS University of London. In normal times, Dr. Rose teaches a class in Zoroastrian studies at Claremont Graduate University, Pomona College in Southern California, and also leads study tours of some of the most important archeological, cultural, and devotional sites in Iran, Central Asia, and along the Chinese Silk Roads. She lectures extensively in person and online at academic institutions, museums, and Zoroastrian Association events throughout North America and in Europe and India. Dr. Rose has published several books on the Zoroastrian religion, her most recent book on which her presentation is based is titled Between Boston and Bombay, Cultural and Commercial Encounters of the Yankees and the Parsis between 1771 and 1865. This was published in 2019 by Paul Grave Macmillan. A few words about what we're about to listen to this evening. It's an illustrated presentation and will focus on some of the earliest trade transactions that occurred between Bombay brokers and American merchant mariners who had sailed to the city from newly independent United States. By the mid 18th century, Parsis had become key players in generating and brokering the raw cotton and cotton cloth, particularly from Surat that was central to the European market. Their role had expanded as members of this community relocated from Gujarat to the burgeoning city of Bombay. There towards the end of the century, many Parsis actively engaged with counterparts from ports in New England and elsewhere along the northeastern coast of America. I don't want to say anything more and spoil all the fun. It's a very interesting story. But I do have to thank our technical team this evening. Without them, these programs could not take place. They're ably led by Professor Jason Johns, Yashraj, and today we have Aishwarya and Rinalini. Thank you very, very much for doing this for us week after week, and now it's almost 20 long months. And with this, I hand Jenny Rose to our viewers this evening, and uh, sit back and enjoy this fascinating journey of a time long gone by. Thank you so much, Jenny, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Feroza. That was a, a lovely introduction. Um, and I'd like to thank you and the executive committee of the Museum Society of Mumbai for inviting me to be with you this evening. I'm sorry that it can't be in person, but I'm so excited that I, there are familiar faces and new new friends at the end of on the other on the other side of the world that I'm able to talk to um, and I, I'd like to uh, thank the Museum Society of Mumbai uh, in conjunction with the CMBS for making CSMBS for making this possible. As uh, Feroza indicated the focus of my talk now will be on some of the earliest trade transactions that took place between Bombay brokers and merchant mariners who had sailed all the way to India from uh, the newly independent United States. Many of these 
early American traders had set out from ports in New England, particularly from Salem, Massachusetts. And I'm going to share my uh, presentation with you now. Uh, I hope that what you're seeing in front of you is a is is a little thumb thumb size image of me and a fireboard that uh, I discovered in the Peabody Essex Museum of Salem, Massachusetts, which represents one of the wharves in Salem Harbor that belonged to a local uh, merchant mariner shipping family. By the early nineteenth century. Uh, this family owned a fleet of uh, ships that were bringing home goods all the way from India and elsewhere in the region that was then known as the East Indies. It was at the uh, Peabody Essex Museum of Salem and the manuscript archives that are attached to the museum, the uh, Phillips Library that's now in Rowley, Massachusetts, that I first conducted uh, research into this connection between America and India in this very early period. Uh, it holds some of the keys to unlocking information about the commercial and cultural action interactions that were going on between America and India at, at this early post-independent period. Uh, other relevant documentation I found uh, also doing uh, a, a short term fellowship at the Massachusetts Historical Society in Boston. And it was while I was in Boston that I was able to visit Harvard University's Houghton and Baker libraries and to look at some of their materials in their archives. Uh, I was also able to spend uh, some time in Mumbai uh, where the archives are different. There's, there's, there, was not so much personal diary writing or journalism, journal writing that I found, but um, there were valuable snippets of information, mostly in the form of historic newspaper accounts and advertisements. So it's from Salem that uh, the story that I'd like to tell you begins. Salem's preeminence in this story of, of global relations is partly due to the fact that it was from here in March of 1788 that a young Harvard educated mariner named Haskett Darby set sail for the Isle of France and that's modern Mauritius. He became, as far as we know, the first American to moor a ship off Bombay and to conduct trade with a, a local broker in Bombay. This 1788 was five years after the Treaty of Paris, and it was that treaty that formally ended the revolutionary wars between America and Britain, and which recognized Americans as free traders. Shortly after the, the treaty had been ratified uh, in December of 1784, an American ship out of Philadelphia named the United States sailed along the Coromandel coast of India to arrive at Pondicherry, that's modern Puducherry. And this was the first ship to raise the American flag in India, in Indian waters, marking the beginning of trade between the two countries. Following the voyage of the ship, the United States, Elias Haskett Darby, who was Haskett Darby's father, uh, he was a Salem based merchant mariner. He had sent one of his ships to the region to find out what commodities might be available and seeking to make the most of what promised to be a lucrative trade with that whole East Indies region, particularly uh, with pepper. Uh, Darby then sent his son Haskett to set up an office in Mauritius, the Isle of France. In September of 1788, Haskett wrote this letter to his father who was back in Salem. Haskett's letter states, I know you won't be able to read it, but um, just down here is, is the bit that I'm going to quote, but at, uh, up at the top, he says that our, on disembarking in Bombay after a 24 day journey from the Isle of France, he found that as an American, he was subject to the same footing with all other strangers. Uh, and that was on 
uh, uh, ha having to pay a duty on most goods. He notes later that the cotton on the Bombay market was much better than he'd imagined because the stuff that he'd seen on the Isle of France was bad. He then comments later on that cotton was almost the only article that the local inhabitants carried on a foreign trade with. By the time that Haskett arrived in Bombay, raw cotton and cotton cloth, particularly from Surat in Gujarat, had become central to the European market. The Parsis in Gujarat had been key players in brokering the cotton for Europeans, who in the early 17th century had established trading posts or factories as they were known along the coast of Gujarat. Some of the Parsis who moved from Gujarat to Bombay during the 18th century expanded this role and so they were primed to engage with American merchants. We find that Haskett's local cotton broker in Bombay was a Parsi with family roots in Gujarat. He's mentioned by name on the fifth page of that letter that I showed you earlier. And this is the fifth page and, and it's right at the top. I, I hope you can see, see this a little bit. Uh, but at the top he writes, my broker's name is Nasawanji Monakji. And he has this kind of astonishing revelation. He is said to be worth 200,000 pounds sterling. So this is 1788 in Bombay. Uh, this is the first recorded instance of a Parsi operating as a broker for an American. From Haskett's records, we know that Nusawanji Monekji sold most of the cargo from Haskett's two ships but that Haskett himself sold, mo sold some of the goods at retail. The cargo included food items that had been sourced from New England. Uh, so that, that was uh, codfish, mackerel, pork, beef, and flour. Uh, Haskett also brought with him chocolate, rum, and gin, which were all being manufactured in the area around Boston at this period, using imported raw materials, particularly molasses from Jamaica. Haskett had also acquired sugar and blackwood, that's probably ebony, uh, en route to uh, Mauritius. His accounts show that he remunerated Nusawanji's clerks uh, and one of his relatives, uh, as well as uh, paying a salary to Nusawanji as his dubash or his agent. Once Haskett returned to the Isle of France, he combined the cargoes of cotton from his two ships onto one of the ships that was called the Peggy, which then sailed directly to Salem. The Peggy arrived at the Derby Wharf, and this is what the Derby Wharf looks like these days, uh, but it arrived at the Derby Wharf on June the 21st, 1789 carrying the first shipment of cotton bought in India by an American. And if you look back from this building towards uh, the uh, mainland, you'll see that there's a custom house here. This custom house was built in 1819, and it was the 13th replacement for a series of custom houses that had been uh, built there since 1649. So the customs permit that was issued from the building that was then in this location for the Peggy, along with the invoice that I found among the ship's papers, indicate that 278 bags and half bags of cotton were uh, unloaded from the Peggy, along with 40 pounds of indigo. The whole cargo of cotton, when I added it up from the invoice, came to about just under 100,000 pounds. And when um, Elias Haskett Darby Sr. realized how much cotton that his son had sent back from India, he was uh, astonished and, and, and rather perplexed. He, he wished, he, he expressed the wish that his son had um, sent coffee rather than cotton because coffee would have, uh, raised a, a much higher price. 
two months, uh, about a month later, after the Peggy had landed it back in Salem, another uh, pair of Derby owned ships arrived in Bombay. Uh, and these were the Light Horse and the Atlantic. This, this is not those two ships, I just put them there so that you have a sense of the, the two ships sailing out together. Um, they were under Haskett's instruction, young, the younger Derby, and the captain on the light horse was named Ichabod Nichols. The supercargo, uh, that's the person who was in charge of the buying and the disposal of the cargo, was Jacob Crowninshield. And it, uh, the wharf that I showed you earlier on the fire board, that was the wharf that was owned by Crown and Shield's family. Um, Jacob Crown and Shield, as an employee of uh, Derby Senior, brought the first elephant uh, back to the United States from India in uh, 1796. And later he uh, became not just a merchant mariner in his own right, but then the state representative for Massachusetts in uh, Washington. That's was between 1803 and 1808. So these, these hardy sea captains who were traveling around the world brought some of that experience and some of that knowledge to bear in our early American statecraft. The two ships, the Light Horse and the Atlantic, uh, sold their cargoes of wine from Madeira and porter and pine tar that was used in the rigging in the shipbuilding industry in Bombay. Uh, and then they loaded Haskett's Blackwood that he'd left with Nusawanji Monekji the year before. And they also took on a new load of cotton, some of which was purchased from Nusawanji Monekji and some from another Parsi broker named Munchaji Karma. Uh, and then they set sail to Canton, that's modern Guangzhou. And so then you can see this triangle develop, developing um, where the, not all of the cotton is brought back to America, but much of it goes to China and goods from China then are loaded to be brought back to America. After Ichabod Nichols' first encounter with Nusawanji Monekji in the summer of 1789, the two kept an ongoing correspondence concerning Bombay trade that lasted until at least 1811. And here's a copy of a letter that was written to Nusawanji Monekji from Ichabod Nichols in early 1793. Uh, you can see that he's writing from Portsmouth, which is in New Hampshire. He'd, he'd left the sea by then to set up uh, uh, as a businessman uh, based in, in Portsmouth. And he's writing to Nasavanji Nasa Monakji uh, to introduce a friend of his, who's also a, a sea captain out of Salem, whose name is Captain John Murphy, who is going to Bombay for the first time to engage in business. Um, and uh, he tells, Ichabod Nichols tells Nasawanji that uh, Murphy is hoping to load pepper or cotton for the Europe market or, or the American market. Um, and he would like the very best quality cotton, of course. And uh, Ichabod Nichols suggests to Nasawanji that I should think it, but that you send to your friends at Surat for such cotton as will best suit this or the Europe market. The clean and long cotton is the only kind that will answer. Uh, of course, Cotton was then being grown in the uh, south of the United States, but it was the short staple variety, such as was used later to make denim for denim jeans, and it couldn't, it, it didn't produce the fine quality muslin uh, that uh, was de rigueur amongst the the elite in in America and Europe. Um, you know. For not just for, for women's clothing, but also for men's cravats and things. Um, Ichabod wonders in this, uh, as he's writing this letter, whether Nusawanji has retired and, you know, using that business connection says, well, if you have retired, perhaps you might recommend some good man that may be depended on with safety to conduct business with the captain. 
At this time, any local Bombay broker who was acting for a European or an American firm had to work alongside the British East India Company. And there were several Parsi brokers who entered into partnerships with company officials or independent British traders who had strong connections to the East India Company. And I've just included this advertisement from the Bombay Courier uh, of August 1795 to show uh, to, an indication of that kind of uh, triangular network, as it were. Um, so the American ship, the Eliza, has arrived in port. It's another ship from Salem, Massachusetts. Um, the goods are going to be sold at the warehouse of Peston G. Bomanji, who was a cousin of Nusawanji Monekji. And um, Peston G. Bomanji at the time was working with the British free merchants, Charles Forbes and Bruce Fawcett, who of course both had strong links with the East India Company. Um, another instance of, of that kind of connectedness uh, functioning in a way that benefited all involves uh, Dan Olney, who was the captain of the ship John Jay uh, on its maiden voyage to Bombay and he arrived about a month before this advertisement was placed in the Bombay Courier. So in July of 1795, Dan Olney writes to the owners of the John Jay, who are the, the firm of Brown, Benson and Ives back in um, Rhode Island, that there's a dispute between the merchants of Bombay and the merchants of Surat which prompted the latter, who were the main suppliers of, of cotton, to withhold their stock from the Bombay market. So Dan Olney is unable to purchase uh, the cotton that he needs from, from the, the cotton suppliers. Um, so he, he's seeking an alternative source and he goes to uh, the assistant at the Bombay Treasury, who was also the Marine storekeeper, for the East India Company, whose name is Alexander Adamson. And he says, you know, who do you recommend? And Alexander Adamson tells him that he um, recommends Dadi Nusawanji as the most influential, respectable, and worthy merchant in the place. And uh, Dadi Nusawanji uh, was a Parsi broker who had previously done business with Brown, Benson, and Ives. Um, so he was familiar to the company, but not to Dan Olney. Daddy Nosawanji was uh, able to supply the John Jay with between 400 and 500 cotton bales from his own store. And he also sourced another uh, 1,100 bales from different merchants. Uh, what's interesting is that Adamson's endorsement of Daddy Nosawanji was, wasn't surprising because the two were in business together. Uh, and as intermediaries between American and government and independent buyers and suppliers in Bombay, local brokers such as Daddy Nusawanji and Nusawanji Monekji became catalysts for change within the prevailing colonial structure uh, relating to commerce. We can see from letters that continue to be sent between Ichabod Nichols and Nusawanji Manekji uh, in 1800 and 1810, that uh, the, their business relationship continues. Uh, this letter was brought back by Ichabod Nichols' son, George, whom uh, his father had sent out to Bombay in 1799. He was just 21, but he'd already uh, been on several very long distance uh, ship voyages, but not to India. This was his first time in India. Uh, and he'd been sent by his father to Bombay to buy cotton and come home with this letter hand delivered. Uh, George Nichols' experiences on, the, in, on this venture were described in his late life autobiography. Uh, and he tells that he returned to Salem from Bombay with a length of thin muslin that he had bought directly from Nusawanji Manekji. And I, I don't know whether you can see this, but this is the, 
the thin muslin here it's 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 kind of aged and discolored but you might be able to make out the the delicate design uh, down the middle of it uh, and he he describes this this cloth as beautiful striped very delicate made in bombay for some distinguished person and the cloth is made into a wedding dress for his bride, uh, Sally Pierce, whom he marries in November of 1801. She wears it, it's so fine that she wears it over uh, a white silk uh, undergarment. Um, and the, the dress, which was then made into a, a party dress for their daughter, Lydia, is still in the archives of the Peabody Essex Museum as is this very large uh, shawl, which is known as the moon shawl. It's got this very large circle in the middle of it, which was an, another gift that was sent to uh, George Nichols from Nusawanji um, Manekchi. And of course they both bear witness to the cultural as well as the commercial impact of these early encounters between America and India. This close up, of um, Crown and Shield Wharf shows the family's ship America, uh, more, and this is the ship that brought the um, the elephant back to New York. Um, it, it's moored off at the end of the pier, so it was engaged in the East Indies trade for several years, and then it served as a privateer in the Anglo-American War. Um, and these ships were then fitted with with guns to be able to act as battleships. Um, before the war began, in, in the years between 1807 up to uh, 1812, uh, there were all kinds of tr trade embargoes and difficulties between America and uh, India. And we have several le letters from Nusawanji Manekji that give us some idea of the dire impact on uh, Indian commerce that was uh, caused by the embargo uh, implemented by the US, which came into effect in the end of 1807, beginning of 1808, and, and lasted for uh, just about a year. So the, in the it, one particular letter, uh, Nusawanji Manekji remarks that none of Ichabod Nichols' ships had visited in 1809 or 1810, after the end of the embargo, but and that the only American vessel into Bombay in the whole of 1810 was the Galloway out of New York. The supercargo, the person in charge of the cargo on the Galloway, was a young man named John Johnston, who had first sailed on the Galloway to Bombay the previous year with instructions from its owners to liaise with Nasa Wanji Monakji Set, a Dubash or man of business, to whom it is preferable to apply than to any European house. So we know that by this stage, Parsi brokers and, and Nasa Wanji Monakji in particular had, had, had a, a good rep, reputation. Um, and um, the, the letter of instruction continues. Nasawanji is reputed a person in his line of the highest respectability. You will therefore immediately call upon him. He will assist you in your custom house business and advise as to the best mode of disposing of your cargo. As with Haskett Darby and Ichabod Nichols, Nasawanji Manekji formed a mutually beneficial working relationship with John Johnston that lasted for many years. According to Johnston's journals, he and Nusawanji Manekji not only discussed business, but also spoke at length about the Parsi Zoroastrian religion. Johnson comments, the Persians of the sect of Zoroaster are very numerous in Bombay and every morning and evening are to be seen without the walls in hundreds prostrating themselves in religious adoration before the sun. Their ideas of God, of the creation, the deluge, heaven and hell are nearly the same with our own, as are likewise their view of moral duties. 
Back home in the dining room of his newly built house in Washington Square, New York, Johnson displayed this portrait of Nosawanji Monekji, which had been gifted to him by his broker. A similar portrait had been donated by Nosawanji to the East India Marine Society in Salem. Uh, actually, it had been, we think it had been bought by Cap uh, Captain John Dalling from Nosawanji because not, it, the donation is under Dalling's name. Uh, Dalling had met Nosawanji in Bombay several years earlier. And the one on the right is the one that Dalling donated to the East India Marine Society in Salem. So Dalling returned to Massachusetts in 1805 with this portrait on the right. And he also brought with him a set of Parsi clothing, which we know had been uh, given by Nosawanji Manechi himself to be uh, transferred to Ichabod Nichols for the express purpose of a donation to the East India Marine Society. Some of the clothing still exists and it resembles Nusawanji's ensemble in the portrait. Business relations that were established between uh, Yankee traders and Nusawanji Manekji's family, they, they become known as the Wadia family, the shipbuilding family, uh, continued through several generations after Nusawanji Manekji's death in 1814. Visiting captains from Salem formed a particularly close contingent in Bombay, and many of them relied on Nusawanji's sons, uh, Jahangir and Nauroji Nusawanji, to supply their cargo of cotton, uh, which were sourced mainly from Surat and Baruj. Uh, and they also relied on, on Jahangir and Nauroji to find and pay for vendors of other goods, many of whom were also Parsis. Uh, this advertisement alerts us to one arrival of a uh, Salem ship into Bombay on uh, December the 4th, 1816. Uh, you can see here, it's the American ship Malabar, uh, Commander Joseph, in fact, his name was Josiah Orne, uh, which had sailed from Boston and all belonged to a, a prominent Salem shipping family. He spent several weeks in Bombay from this time in 1816, December 1816, until February of 1817 and arrived again in uh, late 1818. This was his first trip uh, and his daily provisions were supplied by uh, Bomanji Bairamji and uh, another Parsi, Shapurji Sorabji, provided the necessities to restock Orne's ship, the Malabar, for its return journey. At around the same time, another Salem captain, William Austin, set sail on the ship, the Fawn, from Boston in early June, 1817. Uh, arriving in Bombay via Mauritius in late October. And this is his entry for uh, the day that he arrives in October, 1817. He writes here onwards, at 11 a.m. moored ship, furled sail and repaired on shore. saw my old friends, which suggests he's already visited, my old friends, Jengir and Nuriji, the Parsi merchants, and was not much disappointed on finding the market for imports truly wretched and for exports not very favorable. Uh, he'd known, Austin knew uh, to expect um, not a very good market in Bombay because of the stagnant markets at the Isle of France that he'd encountered en route. This is his entry for uh, the day of after they, he departed from Bombay in December of 1817. Uh, he said, in attempting to stow away a carboy of rose water, uh, which was a present from Jengir and Noriji Nasawanji, 
uh, to Mrs. Gray, who was the wife of the owner of the fawn. Um, the uh, vessel was unfortunately broken and all the contents lost. Um, his, his later comment that the value of the perfume uh, lay in the fact that it was a present highlights the importance of gift giving as a component of commercial transaction between these Yankee merchants and their Indian brokers. A couple of months after the fawn left for home, another ship from Massachusetts, the Tata, arrived in Bombay. Now the Tata had already been to Calcutta several times and to Canton in 1815 to 16. But this was its first voyage to Bombay. Uh, it was captain on this occasion by Richard Sultan Stall Rogers, whose younger brother William was the joint supercargo. William Augustus Rogers was another young man who had graduated from Harvard in 1811, and he'd spent some time with the US delegation in France before returning to Salem to study law. He joined his brother on the trip to India in order to learn the ropes as a merchant and also to gain some kind of financial independence. Roger's log of the Tartar's first trip to Bombay takes the form of a detailed journal. As soon as the Tartar's first trip to, um, had docked at the Custom House Pier, uh, which was located at the north end of what are now the uh, naval docks in Mumbai, Rogers disembarked and met up with his friend Josiah Orne, and they went to be introduced to the brokers Jahangir and Naroji Nusawanji. In his journal, which you can see here, uh, Rogers describes these men as Nusawanji's clever and honest sons. Uh, and he, he says that they had continued their father's a monopoly on American business in the city uh, after his death. He notes that uh, Nusawanji Monekji was himself a man who sustained a most estima estimable character. The reference to Nusawanji Monekji's sons, Jahangir and Naroji, uh, as dominant in the American business is borne out by an advertisement which ran the month after the arrival of the Tata. So this is the Bombay Courier for Saturday, March the 14th, 1818. And it asks anyone who is desirous of a passage to uh, the United States of America or to the Isle of France on the fast sailing American ship Horatio to apply to the supercargo or to the captain, Robert Bunker, who was uh, on Rampart Row, or at Jahangir and Naroji Nasawanji. As the American agents, the company which was headed by uh, the older brother, Jahangir Nasawanji, uh, became recognized as the most extensive of the commercial houses that were located in the square between the town hall and St. Thomas's Cathedral. Uh, Dahangir's Dohan, or his shop, sold goods of all descriptions from purple velvet to raspberry jam. Its walls were fitted with glass cases containing fine French china, gold lace, brandied fruits, riding whips, and other European superfluities. Uh, these descriptions were penned by Marianne Postens, who was the wife of a soldier in the Bombay Native Infantry in the 1830s. She writes that the floor of the store was stacked with cheeses, hams, cases of canned sardines and salmon, and that the attached go-downs or warehouses stored liquors of all qualities. And we know from the um, uh, list of, of, of cargoes on board the American ships, such as the Malabar, the Fawn and the Tata, that many of these goods were supplied from America. The fact that a wide range of goods, of people and currencies are referenced in communications between Americans and Parsis and in other documentation of this period, 
uh, speaks to a global commercial network in which both groups, Americans and Parsis, separately and in conjunction, were central and key participants. The Americans who took part in this global enterprise saw themselves not only as competitive players in a world market, but also as ambassadors for their new republic. And also was kind of conveyors of global knowledge back to the new republic. Um, the opening of this purpose-built East India Marine Hall in Salem in 1825 epitomized the centrality of Yankee merchants in conveying not only the wealth, but also the knowledge that they had gleaned from their overseas encounters uh, and were able there through such collections to um, convey that knowledge to their fellow townsfolk. Some of that knowledge was contained in the logbooks submitted in fulfillment of membership requirements of Salem's East India Marine Society. Uh, and one example of this is this section, I don't know whether you can read this, this section on Bombay in William Rogers' journal, which presents the earliest record uh, of personal discussion by an, an American uh, with a Parsi Zoroastrian and a local Konkani Muslim about their respective religions. Rogers, it seems, was quite receptive to uh, learning about each religion from its adherents. Uh, interestingly, in, in, in contrast, he was scathing of the American Christian missionaries that he had encountered in Bombay, particularly uh, their attempts to uh, teach local children the New Testament in Gujarati. He felt that their hope of converting Gujarati speakers was unlikely to be fulfilled. And uh, I wonder whether that was from uh, conversations with his, his two Parsi brokers. Uh, Rogers was apparently the first of several Americans to record a visit to a Parsi home, uh, albeit a rather palatial one named Lauji Castle. This mansion that was owned by Hormazji Bomanji uh, Wadia, who was a, a brother of Pestonji Bomanji, and also then a cousin of Nuswanji Monekji, was located just below uh, Parel, the, the district. And I read somewhere quite recently that it is within the uh, perimeters of the Raj Kamal film studio. So I'd be quite interested to know if the building is still standing or there's any record of it being in that location. Uh, William Rogers remarks when he visited Loji Castle, it is a very large wooden building, three stories high in the European style. Its entrance is rather imposing. And uh, I would guess from Roger's description, as well as those of, of some British visitors, that it, was, it might have been quite unsettling for American and British visitors to realize that um, their Parsi brokers commanded material holdings that rival the estates of the well-to-do back in Britain and America. Uh, we know from various accounts that the festivities at Logi Castle were legendary throughout the early 19th century. Uh, various dignitaries were entertained there and Charles Forbes gave balls there, which was said to be in opposition to the governor. And of course the governor referred to is the British governor of Bombay who lived in a house uh, in the Parel district, uh, which also had a banqueting hall and a ballroom, but whose entertainments obviously didn't hold a candle to those in the Wadia uh, mansion. At the time of William Rogers' visit, both Homozji Bomanji and uh, his older brother, Jamsetji Bomanji, were lay members of the Bombay Parsi Panchayat, uh, as were other individuals from the Ready Money, the Banerjee and the Seth families. And these urbane Parsis were recognized by both their co-religionists and the British authorities as civic leaders who could guide their peers in community matters. Um, and William Rogers describes 
Jamsetji Bamanji, who was then, uh, of course, the master shipbuilder at the Bombay dockyard, as reputedly very shrewd, a man of great impartiality, who uh, was looked to to arbitrate in Parsi disputes. So in this short talk, I've uh, given a very cursory outline of the beginnings of the relationship between Parsi family firms and American traders from the US at the turn of the 18th to the 19th uh, centuries. At this point, the relationship between the two countries was fairly informal, but over the next few decades, America sought to expand its influence in the region uh, and sent several diplomatic delegations, uh, many of whom were entertained by descendants of the Parsi families that I have mentioned today. Um, but that's a story that we'll have to wait for another presentation. Thank you.